Bunny Gordon. Well, if you're watching on YouTube, you missed, I guess, the first three minutes because the first three minutes I didn't start recording on the Facebook version, which is on Liberty uh, Liberty Principal Facebook page, which is where Burr. we air live. Mm. Did, you say, did you say boogers? No, I said, but if you head on over to D Live. Yeah, we're also on D Live. Well, if you're listening to this on YouTube, the D Live is already over. Oh, yeah, you might not be able to watch it because there's issues. But Yeah, wait, what, what is your D Live channel? Let everybody know. Uh, it's just Bodhi Agora. B O D H I. Dot A G O R A. Yeah. I don't have a D live channel. I got to set one up. So we're being yeah. simulcast tonight on on Facebook, on the Liberty Principal Facebook page, and on D live. And Bodie Gore, you have a different look for the show. It doesn't look like what you'll see, what you're seeing on Facebook. Yeah, and it's just me sitting in my room and Paul sitting on my lap like a little doll. It's. I always wanted to be a little Bodie doll when I grew up, and now my my dreams are come true. And I'm really happy about that. And that's actually the perfect segue to our first story of the day. That is. So I'm going to give a, a just a, a, an opening of uh, <laughs> what we're going to have on the show, and then we'll get to that. That what? is actually a good segue. Yeah, we should have rolled right into it. Oh, should we just roll right into it? You don't want me to set up and tell them the little bit of the stories that are coming up in the different segments? Let's let's get the first story going. Okay. Well, 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 let me let me hold on. Let me play the segment one bump. We're about okay. ready to enter the Lozilla zone. Here we go. When you're battling the powers of coercive associations, it's nice to take a step back and remind yourself that yes, it's okay to have fun, to laugh at yourself, and hey, maybe even laugh at others now and then. Welcome to Lozilla. Lols for the lols. This is Lozilla Lols for the lols. And we're talking about Paris gets a sex doll brothel. Sex doll, sex doll brothel. It's fantastic. It's pretty actually good. cool. Well, I mean, I, I, by pretty good, I mean it's a pretty good story. I'm not. Yeah, it's a good story. I, I don't condone having sex with robots. Well, I mean, can robots consent? Um, I guess that's to be determined, I guess. That's to be determined, whatever your definition of consent and cognizance and all that. I mean, what about what about the most useless machine, you know, that turns itself off? Politician? No, the actual little box oh. that you hit the button and it comes out and goes, turns itself off. And then you hit it again and turns itself off. Oh, that's nice. How about machines that destroy themselves? Have you ever seen them? Yeah. They're pretty awesome. Have. They're They're actually set up to destroy themselves. That's what they're designed to do. They're called I mean, 19 that is like What? They're called 1911s. That is wrong. <laughs> As a 1911 former 1911 owner before the, you know, the boating accident, I take I I definitely take per personal offense at that. But we'll we'll get to our story cuz we're here to we're here to talk stories on the lulls. First, there were sex dolls. And now there are sex doll brothels. Paris gets. Oh, oh you want to? You want to drop the beats? <laughs> That's probably what it sounds like. You walk in there. Paris banana. gets its first. Banana. Sex... Banana. Show, folks. <laughs> I'm gonna murder him in his sleep. <laughs> Paris gets its first ever sex doll brothel, but it's not the first of its kind in Europe. Do you do you want to read the the excerpt here and let me sure. interrupt you? Sure, perfect. That sounds great. Uh, Paris opens doors to France's first ever sex doll brothel. A new brothel is opened oh, in Paris. Really selling this. You're selling it. And pay to fulfill almost all their sexual desires with silicone dolls. Almost the all their sexual desires. That's like, I. That's a pretty bold know. statement. I mean, I especially if you desire, you know, companionship and and. A, you know, a specific woman, no robot can replace that. Oh gosh, don't get all touchy feely and you know, the real the real the real power of love making is when you know the other person is love making back because they want to. Don't give me let's not go down that road. 
Okay. Well, the official X doll site advertises that it has three different dolls on offer: Lily, Sophia, and Kim. Whoa. Whoa. Sophia? So let me guess. Lily is a redhead. Sophia's a nerd, and then Kim is like Asian, complete with okay. pictures of each. I'm not going to this. Okay. The whole. Op- I'm I'm going to go. I'm not going to show it just in case. I'm going to see if my um, race profiling and and um. I'm I'm just gonna see if it's. <laughs> you know what? I'm gonna show. <laughs> if you go to Google Images, I'm gonna show what it is. I think I am. Where where where's my? Uh... Oh, there it is. Website. All right, here. Ready? There we go. All that's, right. That's the image search. Now you can't see it. Although if you got your Facebooks up, Bodie, you can. If you're watching on D Live, if you're listening I have a... to the audio version. I have a link on DLive to go to the Liberty Principle page if you want to go check okay. out the visual on there. Because if you do a search for X dolls, what you end up with uh, is you see the Doge dog and a bunch of different dogs and cat heads and stuff. That's X dolls. So <laughs> that's not exactly what I was looking for. What? Oh my gosh, this picture's great. This one's right here. Have you? Uh, <laughs> it's a. So it's a car seats, and they got these little headrest thingies, and they're cat heads, which are the headrest thingies. So it looks like like cat people things. The, it turns the car seats into cat people things, and you're sitting on cat people things. That's a technical term, <laughs> cat people <laughs> things. So these are X dolls. I, 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 that's not quite what, what, what I thought I was going to find. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to well, go away from it, this. Just part, in case. Of it is, part of it is the whole operation is shrouded in secrecy. In fact, the official website doesn't even offer an address for the brothel, other than says it's somewhere in the 14th arrondissement in Paris. I don't even know what that word is. Arrondissement. What, how is it spelled? A R R O N D I S S E M E N T. Where where's this at? Where's it say that? article. In the article, where? Which 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 paragraph? Oh, the third. Aaron Dizimo, somewhere in the fourteenth. Aaron Dizimo. Let's find out what Aaron Dizimo means. I think that's how you pronounce it. I know how to pronounce it. I think. Aaron Dizimo. Aaron Dizimo. Aaron Dizimo. Aaron Dizimo is a subdivision of a department in France for purposes of local government of administration. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is great. An that administrative is... district of certain large French cities, in particular Paris. So, wait, oh, that adds new meaning to this. Wow. So, somewhere in the 14th arrondissement. Okay. I'd like okay. to imagine that that's like some government district. That's yeah. Where... So, so, to even find the location, you have to pay for a session. So, it's 89 pounds. Is it pound? Oh, euro. 89 euro 89 for an hour. Euros, yeah. 149 for two hours or 19 for the optional virtual reality edition. I don't know. Why what? Would you do that one? What? 19? Or is that just an add on? Is that like a. Is that DLC? No. That's extra DLC. Downloadable. You know, it says optional, so maybe you're right. This is. So you put on the VR glasses? Yeah. They already have those in Japan. So then you get the the enhanced experience of moving around a lifeless corpse, and and plowing it. <laughs> <laughs> to put it bluntly, yeah. Am I right? Yep. Can I get a witness? So while a sex doll brothel is new for Paris, other European cities have embraced the trend in recent years. There have been sex dolls for hire for three years in Gateshead in the UK, which made headlines for its. Try before you buy, Paulus. What the fuck? That's... Whoa. <laughs> all righty. All right. It's a family-friendly show, even though we're talking about. Yeah, this isn't family-friendly. It's, 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 it's family-friendly for adults. So adult so, family-friendly. One opened last week in the Red Light District of Amsterdam. Europe got its first ever brothel when it opened in the Spanish city of Barcelona last February. Last February. These are wow. yodely, yodel. Oh, the, the, 
perfect typo. These are yodely realistic. This is not my typo, by the way. I didn't write this. So it's not both in the movement of their joints to the touch of their skin that will allow you to fulfill, which is also spelled wrong, all your fantasies. Claim the brothel's website, Luma Dolls. Luma Dolls. Ooh, Luma Dolls. I'm going to do a search for Luma Dolls. Humanity is reaching such a low, or at least um, males are so disconnected with females that they're seeking robots. It's kind of weird. Is, is uh, human so Spain's, there's Spain's new sex doll brothel. Okay, so I can show this because it's not too graphic. Let me... All right, I can, I can do this. All right, this it's is just, just a this is a quick glimpse of of the sex dolls, uh, but but it's pretty tame. You're not gonna see any, you're not gonna see any any robo pink. Okay, there is no robo pink on display. <laughs> there we go, there it is, there it is. Enjoy a trip to Silicon Valley in Spain's new sex doll brothel. That's really interesting. So the, the sex doll brothel opens in Barcelona. Barcelona. Now, you know where Barcelona is. They say Spain. There's a very particular part of Spain. Do you know what that particular part of Spain is? No. Catalonia. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. 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 You know what's going on there. It's like, that's, yeah. this is probably why they want to secede from Spain. They're like, dude, where's sex dolls? We don't need you anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, uh, and when they start making sandwiches, it's all over. It's all over. So, I, I, I think we're done with this. What do you think? I, I, we, I, I, I think we're good with this one. Have <laughs> we lit literally driven this into the ground? Do we want to hit another Lozilla story? We're gonna get to the next segment. Uh, next uh, well, what do we have here? An aquarium accident may have given this crayfish the DNA to take over the world. Local high school fights. Instagram account discovered. 2,000 planets discovered outside Milky Way. Fembots are coming. Fembots are coming. What would you like to do? It's your call. Um, do it quickly, though. This is a I really, I want, I really want to check out the iScience. iScience? You want to go to iScience? Yeah, we spent about okay. 20 minutes on this one. So. Okay, we're going to go to iScience because we're probably going to spend a little bit more time on that segment. So brace yourselves, ladies and gentlemen, as we switch. As we switch modes and suddenly the show and everything changes. We scour the interwebs in search of the strange, the useful, the bizarre, the entertaining and scientific news. Welcome to iScience. Uh, Voltrog's music, I, I think, I'm pretty sure that's Voltrog's music that is the bump for the iScience one. And you didn't hear it. So I picked this story for you. I thought that, that you'd be able to pour through this and uh, we'd be able to, 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 to run with it. Mm -hmm. so what, is, what, what is the, I can't even remember, what, what is the eye science story here? Uh, uh, no. Where is it? No. Oh, here. No, the universe is not simple elegance. There you go. The striving towards simple elegance in science sometimes takes us away from the terrible reality of life's irreducible complexity. That's the thinking behind an article that outlines how the elegant universe model has been dismantled, leaving us with an uncertain complexity regarding the nature of the universe's very existence. I wrote that part. That was me. I like it when you read my words. I know. It's like you're inside me. Pat. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, yes. So, I mean, this is something that I think you've talked about before. Uh, this is an article from Forbes right. of all places. And basically, the, the uh, my idea of it is that the more we learn about the universe, the more we learn we don't know. So basically for every discovery, there's like an umpteen number of mysteries. So actually the more we discover, the more complex it gets, not the more simple it gets. That seems to be the case. So right. Because if we only knew like, you know, natural law, 
basics and and physical laws and stuff like that. Well, that's all you need to know. All you need to know is natural law. You know the nap, yeah. the nap, and property rights. My nap. That's it. That's that's it. that's all you need to Simple exist. Simple elegance. That's all you need right there. The That'll Newtonian take you to the Newtonian universe right there. Yep. So I'll I'll read a little bit of the uh, article. Should, is this from England or something? Can I can I don an accent? Do it. Well, even if it's not. There, there is a temptation towards reductionism in physics to describe as much as possible with as little as possible. The idea that there exists a theory of everything or a single theory that can predict and describe everything that can be predicted or described in the universe to the maximum possible accuracy is the ultimate dream of a great many scientists. Now I gotta interrupt you here. Hold on, I gotta interrupt you. I gotta tell you a story. All right. This is this is important. Very important. So I got this book called The Theory of Everything. I think there's a number of books actually that's been called that. And I got this book. This was uh, maybe around 1999, something like that. I can't remember when it was. And I ordered it, and I started reading the book. And the first part of the book is like, like the history of science. It was really good, really cool. Yeah. And they're setting you up for the theory of everything, their theory of everything. And they're telling you, you know, gravity doesn't exist. Gravity is a myth. Uh, uh, Newton is wrong. And I'm about halfway through a 300-page a book. I'm really enjoying it. And then it finally gets revealed what his theory of everything is. Are you ready to hear it? Yeah. The universe is growing. Everything is growing. Everything is getting bigger. We're all getting bigger. Gravity is really the planet beneath us just getting bigger and pushing up on us. That was what I got to 150 pages into this book. I'm just going to tell you that I did not continue to read. Yeah. I... <laughs> the end. Wow. Very disappointing. But, wow. you know, it, it goes to this. People are so, they, you know, they, they're so desperate to find a theory of everything. They will, rather than trying to simply pursue what is, they will try to constrain their perception to fit into a neat little box. Yeah, I, I think personally I would lose my mind if we ever actually had the finite, if we reached the, the, a level of finite knowledge. It wouldn't be fun for me anymore. What's the point? What do you mean? What if you just knew every if you knew every, if you knew everything there could be to know, I'd be bored as hell. Not unless there were an infinite ways to express what you knew. You right. Know, creating... well, yeah. I mean, you, you, there'd still be creation. So yeah. you could be creating vast symphonies that can't even comprehend what they might sound like, or a, a mix of genres and mediums and new art forms and who knows right you could find like an infinite expression once you understood everything to a finite level right and i mean then you get into super tasks and and completing the infinitum uh, but that's uh, it's more theoretical it's still useful but it's theoretical I'm just saying if I knew everything, I could probably not be bored. I think maybe. I could have fun with it. Yeah, maybe. But you would have a problem. You would definitely have a problem. I would have a huge problem. You'd see stuff, but you're like, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to pick it apart, and I'm going to die. Oh, never mind. Never mind, I can't. It's correct. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, what did you just? Oh, yeah, that's right. That's correct. <laughs> So the, the article goes on. I think this, this is a good point. Uh, the, lesson that f the lesson from Kepler is not that we must refrain from asking what seems to be fundamental questions. The lesson is that we cannot know whether there is any simple answer or where it may come from. Yeah, I, I rest very. I mean, it was a long while, a long time where that was a real problem for me because I actually... I still have this tendency. I like to control things. I don't know if you figured that out about me. I'm well aware. 
<laughs> so this is a hard thing to get over, but now it's a source of comfort that I, I, there isn't a simple answer and I don't know where everything came from. And yeah, that, 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 that has put me to a place actually in a lot of ways. This is how I've got to my stand on your preferences thing. It's like everybody's trying to chase around statistics and morality to justify this is why you should be this way rather than no no this is my preference and uh you know i have my boundaries so if you want to try to impede my preferential path i may decide to take action against you because of it and that's it that's yeah. simple yeah but well, it goes on uh Elegance, beauty, and reductionism may offer some tremendous opportunities for successfully predicting new physical phenomena, but there is no guarantee these predictions will be borne out in reality. When it comes to uncovering the next great breakthrough in fundamental science, our hopes and dreams that will be closer to a unified theory of everything through mathematical beauty and additional symmetry is a common one, but is no sure thing. May we all be as open to whatever the data tells us as Kepler was, and be, and be willing to follow it no matter where it leads. That's beautiful. That is right. heartfelt beauty right there that just... It just off the page yeah. and out of your mouth is the thing to behold. But that, that's the idea. I think, I think the unified theory of everything is the antithesis of science. It closes doors, but yeah. something... I mean, it's highly marketable to come up with a theory of everything. For people that are scientifically illiterate, yeah, it's a great way to sell books. Which is most <laughs> That makes sense. <laughs> I mean, if you're going to sell books and you want to sell to a big audience, don't target scientifically literate. <laughs> it's a limited audience. But even scientists among themselves, they're, they're chasing after the theory of everything because it means... They're not real scientists. What's that? They're not real scientists. When I say scientist, I'm not speaking of all scientists. I'm not trying to collectivize scientists. I don't want to do that. I'm not saying to to collectivize all scientists. I'm just no, driving. No, I was, point I was further. Speaking, speaking to the audience, not you. Oh, oh I forgot. I'm sure there's some audience member out there, <laughs> some some and capper, waving their yellow and black flag, going, "My collectivization." I have property rights. It's the only right. <laughs> yeah, life life can be reduced to two simple uh, rules. All you gotta the, do: the nap and property I'll, rights. I'll let you in on a little clue. I covered this in my karma video, which you can go check out on DTube. But Pretty cool. essentially, like the universe doesn't care. Yeah, the universe is impersonal. It really is. Like it, it doesn't. It doesn't care. There's, it's, there's, there's some truth to be said that there's a real possibility. It's not guaranteed, but there's a real possibility that what you put out there tends to come back to you but it's not the universe it's kind of it's what it, it's your choice of context it's where you choose to be it's how you choose to act and treat people and how they'll choose to react yeah it's it's the consequences of your actions is essentially what it is if you look at if you look at history there's a very common like what goes around doesn't necessarily come around um, there's a lot of people that go unpunished. There's a lot of good deeds that go unrewarded. So, yeah. it, 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 in a in the way people, it'll right. come in my next life. It'll come in my next life. They, why even focus on that? Just focus on what you can do now. As Joel Olstein said, "Have your best life now." Probably I actually that book. I don't disagree with that. That's actually pretty. Yeah, have your yeah. best life now. But uh, he's he's a Christian, a sensible Christian. Uh, but uh, anyway, um, sensible Christian is that what you just said? Ostensible. Oh, I think it's the scent of a Christian. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> that too. If I really wanted to be a meanie head, but mm -hmm. I, I'm not going to go down the theology road today. But you know, it's there is some truth to it. It's if you're spending 
you know, yeah, if you're spending your life looking for the big payoff that's not in this life, um, you might have yeah. a problem. I'm, I'm not saying <laughs> that you, you can't have some degree of anticipation of some great reward, but if that's your focus, that's the yeah. problem. You're gonna you're you're, you're missing things. You you yeah, you're yeah. missing things. You're missing your best life now. <laughs> and and the thing is that yeah, the 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 jerk water down the street who uh is womanizing all the ladies and getting them all pregnant and getting away with it. Dude lives to be eighty years old, plugging away. You know, when he's eighty he's still plugging away at the sixty year olds. He dies happily in his sleep. <laughs> that happens. <laughs> that happens. The universe has, did not come back on him. No. But I think it's pretty rare, though. Generally speaking, I think it's. I. I don't know. I don't. I don't have scientific data to back up my 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 gut reaction. Well, the the, the other problem with waiting for the next life to kind of equalize things is that you miss out on justice and and doing things right now. Because it's not up to the universe or some cosmic being to, to right wrongs or to help fellow man or do anything like that. It's up to you. And I think people miss out on a lot of opportunities to act because they expect someone else to intervene. And it's called the um, bystander effect. This is why large crowds of people when someone's crying for help or whatever, no one responds because they assume someone else is going to take care of it. When in reality... It's up to you, and it only takes one person to start things in motion, and others will follow suit. That's yeah, it's, what it's always that, up to you. Yeah. Whatever is in front of you, it's up to you, not up to anybody else. Yeah. Right. You're the only one that can do anything about it. So what I really like about this article is, well, the the elegant, simplistic universe tends to produce absolutarianism. You, yes. you believe that you've, you've locked into a niche and you got it all figured out and you have this very rigid structure about you and anybody who doesn't fit within that rigid structure becomes a heretic of some form. I, I, have, I really have a problem with absolutarians. I, have a, I, have a, I think I wrote on my Facebook page recently, I was being a little trolly, but I was being a little serious too, that I... I, one thing that I am certain about is that people who are too certain annoy me. <laughs> yeah. I don't trust them right away. You're too I certain. Mean, nope. Nope. I like right someone with confidence about their ability to overcome whatever may, may be there. But when they're, you know, dead set on this is how I'm going to do it or whatever, they're setting themselves up for failure or at least disappointment. Okay. Well, we don't have any comments. You folks need to comment here. I got Caleb. Caleb has joined us. Valia. Uh, Jacob is here. Walt. Jim Leonard said, behave. <laughs> there you go. Jim, Jim, Jim commented there. I love Jim. Uh, He's a good guy. I don't know if you got any comments on your D lives or not. I got a couple. I got some from Voltrog and then Jimmy, Jimmy Lynn. He said the stream looks good. Uh, that's about it. Uh, who's Mr. V well, what did Mr. Volt? I almost said who's Mr. Voltrog. I know full well who Mr. Voltrog is. Mm -hmm. What did Mr. Voltrog have to say? He said, hello, I am here. Sounds good. Oh, my gosh. Thank you, Voltrog. Thank you for that. Right, right. So looking through these science stories, I, I think we're done here with this. I think I think we're done here. Uh, is there any more science? Yeah, Bio and human tissue. A a story on that. Quantum interaction in one material, and eh, lasers uncovered thousands of ancient Mayan homes, palaces, eh, discovery of stone tools, eh, muscles remember their past growth, scientists can document it, eh, no. You don't like any of those? Nah. Not even the Mayan homes thing? So what? We knew stuff was there. Yeah, but it, it, it changes people's assumptions about these civilizations, that they're far more complex and possibly a lot older than than they thought well, they they're not saying for sure if it's older but still it, it doesn't for me that doesn't change anything that's just like okay okay i i think that there are probably people that are watching and listening that would 
probably think that's cool. But all right, do you want to go? You want to go see what? Not necessarily, what... no. I just I, actually, I was just teasing there. I don't. I'm hoping that the audience will comment if they want to hear that. If you want to hear that, if you want to hear about lasers, or you want to hear about the stone, to that's interesting. The stone tools in inner India. Essentially, the the India story is they found stone tools that are. They're, I think they're dated to like 365,000, 385,000 years ago, while the current theory is that uh, advanced hominids didn't arrive in India. Tool-making hominids didn't arrive in India until 140,000 years ago. Hold on. I'm going to click on that. I want to see what they use. The stone tools that were dated, but what was the dating method? If it's carbon dating, that could be off by freaking thousands of years so a huge find in india may have tremendous implications as far as our understanding of mankind's migration out of africa and it certainly challenges okay whatever i already it's three hundred eighty-five thousand years ago the tools were found at adder uh, adderampakum adderampakum luminescence dating a luminescence dating what do you know about that i don't know anything about it nothing i don't know anything about that Luminescence dating, so that's that's how they dated it, and I don't know anything about. Let me see if I can find something on luminescence, luminescence dating. Uh, is a type of dating methodology that measures the amount of light emitted from energy stored in certain rock types and derived soils to obtain an absolute date for a specific event that occurred in the past. There it is. Absolute. That's what he. That's what he read for. An absolute date. Absolute date. Oh, my gosh. Did that word trigger you just now? It did. Radiation dose, range of 50 hand per 1,000 years. So it's a, it's about 1,000. It's within an accuracy of 1,000 years. So they say. So they but, say. Yeah. I, I, you know, now, here's a, here's a case in point, like, how certain are you? Like, do you just take it at face value? And I don't take it at, say, face value. I don't assume that this story is totally true. I also don't assume the story is totally false. I'm like, well, right. that's, that's interesting. Well, I'd like, to, I'd like to learn more. I'd like to see where they go. I'm kind of hoping it's true, though. I'd love to see. I'd love to see timelines getting messed up. I, yeah. I, I'm of a belief that we may very well have had and I this is gonna sound crazy. I I think that there's at least a chance that there have been complex civilizations that have come before us that are completely disappeared that may have happened two or three other times that we don't even know about that for one reason or another they were wiped out. Like, you know, when when uh, the, the the flood waters rose and and we lost all the coastlines. So it was about twelve thousand five hundred years ago, somewhere around there. I don't think there's been any evidence of a global flood. You don't? No. I've, I've heard a lot of evidence about global floods. I mean, yeah, it all goes back to the Bible. No, no, it has to do with what archaeologists have found. You know, like strata that indicates a floodplain and other stuff really so yeah you know, all kinds of evidence of not necessarily a global flood uh, and i'm not talking about a global flood anyway oh. what i'm talking about is a localized floodplain flood localized it's 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 well it's global in the sense that uh when the ice age ended when the last little mini ice age when the ice age twelve thousand five hundred years ago had a little global warming and he's waving Waving to his gal pal, gal pal Friday. Gal pal uh, Friday. It's what Tuesday. What happened was the the oceans rose. So this isn't. I'm not talking about like a f one flooding event. I'm talking about the oceans rose because the ice glaciers melted, okay. and then a lot of coastlines were lost. This is well known. It's like this is how it is that you know there was it's a bridge okay. between. Yeah. You know, the Bering Strait, there used to be a land bridge there. That's gone. There's a mm -hmm. lot of coastline that's gone around the world after this. And where would yeah. 
where would your early civilizations have been? Most, even now, humans tend to, they tend yeah. to gravitate towards rivers and coastlines. Still do. Yeah. Like yep. two-thirds of the population of the United States is along its coastlines. That's why if you live near a city, not, if you live, if you live in a city that's not near a body of water, you're dumb. You're for the dumbs. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, you're for the dumps. Unless you have a really good gray water system going on and and uh, stuff. And then yeah, the groundwater. You're still close to a body of water, but that's that's driven most of civilization. So yeah, so it wouldn't be. I don't think it would be ludicrous to imagine that underneath the seas, deep underneath the seas, there may lie civilization yet to be yeah. discovered. Like they just discovered Gibetle Tepe, whatever it's called, up in Turkey. Giblet Tepe. What, 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 yeah, sure, why not? That that whole, it's a, like a massive religious complex, or they, they think it's religious, they don't know for sure, but they, I think they... That's all of, assume. that's all of Turkey now. What's that? That's all of Turkey now, it's a giant theocratic state. Yeah, but this is different, this is not... Hey, Turkey. Oh, well, I have a new name. I, 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 I call them something. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I call them, I, I call them the Turk Reich. I'm going to get my, I'm going to let everybody get a look at uh, Gebekli, Gebekli Tepe. It's probably, so you see what it, it's probably a J, or a Ch. Th- 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 this was uh, discovered, I don't know, back in the 90s. Never, we never even knew about this. It was just discovered recently. Hmm. And... So the theory has always been there was farming and then there were cities and then they had the religious whatevers. Well, here they they find evidence that suggests possibly, I wouldn't want to say definitively that this is religious in nature, but it suggests that there was this these massive religious complexes, but there was no evidence beside it of 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 massive civilizations, you know, cities and whatnot. So what, wh- 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 why did this come into being? Hmm. Uh, kind of, it's kind of messing with the theory, potentially messing with the theory. And then the other theory is that uh, what you're seeing here is uh, that Gebekli Tepe is like, it's a, a, resi- a, a, a remnant from an advanced civilization that was lost during like the 12,500 period and that remnant still held on to some civilizing stuff so they built Gebetle Tepe and that explains why even though there's this massive what appears to be religious complex and there's no there's no corresponding urban development that that would explain it I don't know but anyway it's it's interesting and and I guess it goes to the the, the science story that we talked about, about yeah. everything being irreducibly complex. Yep. We keep, we keep getting new data that suggests that we don't, what we, we assumed is maybe not necessarily what we thought. And these, even, even this, the idea of this linear development of humanity is kind of falling apart. Yep, as we advance into the future in, t- in sorts of all new technologies and methods of building. Oh, good transition. Let's get to that transition. I'm going to hit the bump. <laughs> yeah, you're like the Ed McMahon to my Johnny. I'm on. Nagging thoughts, trending debates in the Liberty community, and even random epiphanies are all fair game and I ponder where ideas are given space to bloom. I think you kind of stink. Uh, I ponder. Put it in the sink. I ponder. You're just a dink. Ding, ding, a ding, dink ding, and I ding, ponder. Ding, so ding. The story that I picked, do you, you want to just, I, I think you should just cover the story because yeah. this is you. Go ahead. Uh, oh, we're, we're back. You did the... Yeah, I did the bump. We're back. Oh, I didn't know we were back. I don't have the little light go on. It's so, only like check... a 10, 12 second bump. 
Yeah, okay. Well, challenging and revolutionizing architecture through 3D printing. How 3D printing is disrupting the architecture and design industry. Professor Aki Menges, head of the renowned Institute of Computational Design at Stuttgart University, knows that innovation is an invitation to leave behind old thought patterns. First, you use the new technology to build objects in the traditional way, as demonstrated demonstrated by examples from China, where they are building conventional houses with 3D printers, he says. Designs and constructions that are genuinely specific to the new process are not created until the second step. That's actually... Um, I can't one process thing is, what that just meant. What, what that means is that um, a great example is how wrought iron was first used. It was used basically ornamentally, and it basically looked like wood carvings. It looked like certain shapes. It looked like the traditional building structures or what we would do with floral designs because that's all they knew how to design with as, as we began to get iron. We didn't get steel beams for a ways after that until people became more comfortable with the material and its structural integrity. So what he's saying so then is... When we, get, when we get a new technology, we use it to do what we already know how to do. We don't use it to push to the new envelope yet until we build with it the old way and then understand the properties and then we can extrapolate from there. And I'm showing a picture here of uh, it's a, a 3D printed concrete castle as, as one example. There's a picture of a huge 3D printer can print an entire two-story two house and as you can see in the picture it's it's a conventionally designed home that's yeah. that's the point you're making there yep all right go on i'm sorry even though it allows us to do new things we just haven't gotten quite we just haven't quite gotten there yet so this means for example that 3d printing will make geometric complexity in building construction possible without much additional effort or expense this knowledge in turn informs the design process mengus says just as developments in software change the aesthetic of architecture, so could 3D printing. Because the technology creates components with multiple layers, we will have the possibility of creating very complex building components with gradient characteristics. Okay, could you Com explain that? What's that mean, gradient characteristics? So are you, does this just mean that you can have more imaginative detail and angles and stuff like that? Is that what we're talking about? Um, well, the idea of layers is like the building, the building sandwich. So like, you know how, you know how like a, a regular sheetrock wall is constructed. You have the two by fours and then you have, um, depending on what it is, plywood or, or then, um, sheetrock and then another layer of sheetrock and then you paint it and then you have your finished pieces or whatever. You can actually skip those layers because the nature of constructing it could be from bottom up. So you can actually have a gradient from – you're not oh, building a sandwich anymore. So what they mean by gradient is, is not, not, a, not a gradation in design, but a gradient as far as you could be printing from the same material and you could – on one part it's harder and another part it's softer. It could have different yep. properties, I guess. Yeah, different properties, and it's easier. You know, it also changes the construction process. So as you're printing, you can actually leave a cavity for conduits, such as electrical or plumbing and stuff. You don't have to build your, your structural frame or whatever and then drill holes through it and then run your conduits through it. You can actually print your conduits as you're going. It changes the entire construction process. So it makes. I'm. I'm assuming it makes it cheaper. It makes it. Uh... It makes it faster. It leaves out the um, potential errors and coordination problems. Like you, you're going to be able to build it and coordinate it completely in 3D and then print it as it worked. Because like when I was working in sprinklers and stuff, we would have coordination meetings. We would even design stuff in 3D and sit down with everyone and have all these plans or whatever. And then the guy that didn't attend the meeting went out and hung his drain pipe across the beam that you had to run on. And it, changed everything with this you're just printing it it's already it's already coordinated 
before no it human even being starts. can hang their proverbial across the way in a way that blocks or impedes Another, or changes. Yeah. Yep. Wow. So so then we're talking about maybe houses won't look like they look now. Correct. So they won't have, have they won't have to look the way they look. Because a lot of the shapes, a lot of the sizes and stuff like even with carpet, you, your carpet rolls come in 12 foot rolls. 12 foot or 15 foot rolls. So a lot of times designers or architects, if they're smart, when they design rooms and stuff, they're not going to design a room that's 12, three wide. Right. Because then you need to get a bigger piece. You're making more waste or whatever. Uh, same thing with sprinklers. They have a certain dimension to them that's been developed over time based on the standard construction process. What's well, kind of what? like with cars. So cars early on, like 30s, 40s, uh, especially the 30s and the 40s, cars were designed, they were designed to last. They were intended for you to have for a while. So they put a lot of effort into cars and they put a lot of curves into cars. They were very stylistic. But curves cost money. Curves are much more difficult to manufacture on a large scale than straight lines. Mm -hmm. So you ended up, gradually cars started to straighten out. And especially when, uh, when the when when Detroit caught on that, hey, let's try to get people to buy a car like every year or, or, or as close to every year as possible. The new design, the new exciting designs, and so then because of that, then they started to straighten out. You had less curves. Yep. So this is like the reverse. Now suddenly you can add style and individual flair without it dramatically increasing your cost. Mm -hmm. This is why homes are, I mean, you know better than me, why homes are largely rectangular, straight, and... Right. It's easy to build. Easier. Easy to it's build. Easy to build. It doesn't have to be anymore. And it goes on to say component components. This I think this explains the... Um, Gradient, gradient characteristics. Components could be soft on one end and hard on the other due to different printing materials being used in the course of the printing with a multi-material printer. So they could actually print the carpet on the floor. Yeah. They, they, or, and or, or make the walls softer so they absorb more sound. Yeah, and they can, they can and print your electronic slap. circuits and everything right into it. And yep. Because that's happening, electronic printing. And, and if you add to the, wow, you think about where electronic printing is going. It's becoming micro. It's becoming wireless, wireless electronics. Man, I'm telling you, it's it's an exciting world. It's, you know, I had this dream. Back in, I discovered, now 3D printing's been around for, for a while. But I learned about 3D printing back in 2003. And when I discovered it, it was much more primitive than it is now, but I immediately saw the potential. I've been a 3D enthusiast, 3D printing enthusiast, waiting for it to arrive. And I have this dream between 3D printing and, and using uh, nanotechnology and 3B, 3D printing and nanobots. So I have this dream, this mm -hmm. silly dream, that I'm going to one day, I'm going to go... I might not. I, I might go down to the to the to the car dealership. And the car dealership, it may have on display so it, it, for the purpose of you being able to touch the vehicle, see what it looks like, to experience it full on, not just look at a computer display. Although maybe, and, and this was a vision then, but maybe now you just use VR. You don't even right. go to the dealership. You use VR, but you go to the dealership. And you pick out your design and you tweak it. Like, I I would love, I want a 57 Chevy. No, no. I want a 53 Buick Skylight convertible. But I want it to be, I don't want it to be authentic. I don't want it to be like a piece of crap that the 
be where Skylark actually was. And, I mean, and when I say piece of crap, I mean in relation to how cars are now. Power steering and all the all the stuff that vehicles have now, they're way, way better. But it's a beautiful car. So I mm. want that. I want the look. I want it to look like a Buick Skylark convertible, and I want it to have all the bells and whistles of, of a modern vehicle. And I can order that vehicle, and there will be this vat of this material, like whatever it is, like some liquidized weird material. And that liquidized material is where these nanobots can go in. And these nanobots are collecting molecules from basic uh, elements. And from the inside out, they're literally building the, the, the car, all the components, everything. And then the liquid is drained out, and then there's your car all printed. Mm -hmm. That's my dream. Fantastic dream. Isn't it? <laughs> Isn't it? I, but now, I mean, we're, we're not far down the road from... Uh, and, you know, the, you think about down the road... You're in your house. You're there for about five years, six years. You're bored with your house. The design is pretty cool, and you know what? You're bored. I say, you know what? I don't want this anymore. That's so how you call over the 3D building company, and they come in, and they destroy your house, but they use the material. Yeah. They just put the material <laughs> back through the system, and then they print you out a new house. Custom yeah, design to your specifications. I think you're going to end up with a lot more round homes than you have now. No, because furniture is still square. Does it have to remain square? Uh, you don't actually probably don't even need furniture. You can just build it in. Yeah, you can build it into the wall. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's uh, the, the sky's the limit. It's 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 pretty exciting stuff. It'll change. It'll literally change in time. I don't know. Now, this, I think they're a lot further away from seeing a lot of this stuff come to fruition. But then I remember in 2003, honestly, I mean, I saw things coming. But even in 2003, I was thinking 30, 40 years for some of the things that I'm already seeing now. Right. So Yeah. It's like, it's increasing exponentially. It's, it's increasing... And, and, and that that goes back to our eye science story about the um, the, the complexity of, of the universe and, and our knowledge base and science and it, the, that unified theory, if anyone even decided upon it, would probably only be accurate for a day. That's true, and and you know, we we've touched on this in this show. I think we even touched on it in the last show. You, the the more you know, the less you know. Yep. And that's what's happening. So it's fantastic. I love it. Being able to actually come up with a unified theory is getting more and more difficult because we keep find, finding layers of complexity that we, we, we didn't even understand. It's like, so what you see produced, you see these incredible, fantastic things that are starting to emerge and uh, across the board. You have, uh, they're, they're, they're going. They're they're working on being able to 3D print biological cells yep. that can go into the body and sp and like 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 lasers go after a particular disease, and it's because they have this understanding, a new understanding of the complexity of the of the microverse, if you will. But okay, so you see that you think, say, we're really we're mastering it, we're getting on top of it, but. What they've what okay, so they've they've come to an understanding of the complexity of the microverse that they didn't have before, but in that process of 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 seeing this complexity and even being able to use it in some pretty fantastic ways, what they see underneath it is like ten, fifteen, twenty thousand layers of complexity that they didn't even know existed. Right. So they're getting further with ev with with each Dive Which each deeper. Yeah, we're getting further away. Yeah. That's it's awesome. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, I love that. You know, you, you, the, it, you, it keeps it, keeps the romance. It, it keeps the like the literary sense of romance, the, the unknown, that the just on the brink, uh, the sublime. It keep it keeps the sublime alive. 
Well, the thing well, I, the thing I, I like it, right now, most of us, e even even my daughter, oh, she's only thirteen, but still, even her, for most of us, still, we're we, we're growing up, or we've grown up in a world in which we have this idea that we are heading towards a finite understanding. Mm -hmm. Most people, I believe, kind of operate in that in that mindset. Right. If if you see a paradigm shift where most human beings begin to understand the reality, which is the deeper you go, the further you are away from knowing, I think a lot of the absolutarianism crap out there begins to fall away. Yep. Because people are not going to be able to continue to hold on to this notion that they can build a finite understanding of the universe or our human behavior or anything. Yeah, but especially same, behavior. <laughs> especially and, behavior. Especially behavior. But at the same hand, like, okay, so like I pointed out, so you've, you've come to a deeper understanding of the microverse. And because of that deeper understanding, you suddenly see there's way more complexity than you thought there was. So in terms of understanding the microverse, you've actually gone further away. But in that process you have still come up with applications that can be utilized right. in a yeah. very practical way. So it's like the, you know, the quest. You, you know more than you did, but now you know less more. The quest towards knowing less yields constructive, useful, have your best night life now discovery. <laughs> there. Yeah. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. Is that is that is that what you were saying? Pretty sure. Much? Yeah. yeah. So on that note, I think uh we we we've uh we've come to the end of our show. Actually, yep. uh this is a different vibe. What do you think? Yeah, it's a good show. Good good times. Good times. I, I, I think this is this is This is it. This is how I like this to be. I like this this particular vibe. And yep. we'll just yeah, we'll We'll cover one or more stories or whatever happens. We'll just we'll just go with it. And I and now that I've had I finally got it so that I have scenes to show. I really like being able to show the websites and so on weird stuff like that. And I'd appreciate feedback, feedback from folks. Let me know what you like. Let me know what you didn't like. And uh, uh, let me stress the part of let me know what you like. Becca said hi. Hi, Becca. And. I'm going to be back on my channel tomorrow, on my Facebook page tomorrow for headlines you may have missed. Great show. Check and it out. Yeah. It's headlines you may have missed. Actually, a lot of these stories ended up on headlines you, you may have missed. Yep. But I, I, I only cover them superficially compared to what we do on uh, Is Daily. And tomorrow night is Daily Wednesday with Niz. Pretty soon we're gonna have to mix some stuff up. I, I want I want to get some some now that I've got some stuff settled out. I'm ready to start having a couple shows where we have like three of us on at a time sometimes. Yeah, I think that'd be a great time for. I think a great time for that would be a Friday. No, no shows on Friday for me. Oh. No, not not on the only time I wouldn't I wouldn't have a regular schedule. That would be like something spontaneous, because Fridays are like my planning and design days, man. That's when uh -huh. I look at everything, figure out what's working, try to tweak things and that fix works. things. Yeah. So, do you have anything? Do you have any last things to say to our studio audience here before we uh, punch this puppy in the head? No, I'm good. Thanks for watching. Emotions? Uh, go to agora.threadless.com and buy my stuff. It's great support for me. Thank you. And go to iState.tv and you'll find everything there that is me and all the shows and everything else. All right. I'll see you tomorrow at 12.30 p.m. or thereabouts. Sometimes I can do it a little earlier, Eastern Standard Time. And we'll see you right here. Me and the one true Niz will see you tomorrow night, Wednesday night, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We do news fire. We talk about politics and stuff like that. And we do, uh, what do we do? Oh, we do dystopian tech and liberty tech. All right. I don't know why we're doing this, but we're doing this. Oh, this one's eh, and this one's eh. This is the, the British raspberry, right? Sure.
the worker salute, the British worker salute. <laughs> yeah. And then this is peace, man. Peace. All right. We'll see you guys. Thank you for joining us. Good night, everybody. <laughs>